determination of lattice parameters of a body centered cubic metal using simulated X ray diffraction data. Part 2 Concepts about PCC unit cell and X ray diffraction. Hello, on this video we'll be approaching some concepts related with the solid-state chemistry and X-ray diffraction, specifically applied to the case of uh, body-centered cubic unit cells, okay? Among the concepts we're going to be talking about in this video, we can have here the list and the bullet point. First, we're going to start with like how to uh, determine the number of lattice points per unit cell in a BCC unit cell. Then, how to calculate the density based on the lattice parameters of a BCC unit cell, how to calculate the atomic radius and the volume uh, for a BCC unit cell, uh, how to determine the allowed reflections, okay, which types of uh, combination of Miller indices are allowed to have uh, reflections in the powder X-ray diffractogram in the case of a BCC unit cell, and then going more to general cases, so how uh, the peak positions in the X-ray diffraction peaks, they are determined, okay, more for the cubic, uh, we'll be using an example for a cubic unit cell in this case, and also more, again, in more general lines, how the peak intensity of XRD peaks in a diffractograms, they can be determined, okay? Remember that everything you talk about X-ray diffraction here, is valid and focus more like to the powder X-ray diffraction than for single crystals, okay? Let's see how to calculate the number of lattice points per unit cell in a body-centered cubic unit cell. Here on the left, we can see a body-centered cubic unit cell. Body-centered cubic is usually uh, called by the acronym BCC, okay? So here, as you can see, the unit cell is cubic, so all dimensions x, x, y, and z, they have the same lattice parameter, okay? And then the convention adopted here is that the x-axis is this one, point towards uh, the, the, the reader, okay? The y-axis is this one, point towards uh, the origin to the right, and then the y, the z axis is the one point to the origin up, okay? So that's the convention that has been adopted. Now let's talk about the number of the lattice points. As you can see here, uh, the BCC unit cell uh, is made up of eight uh, corner lattice positions, which are the ones shown on the red dashed line. Basically, what happens is that each one of those corner uh, lattice positions that's occupied, uh, well, only one over eight of them is contained within the unit cell, okay? So that's how we read that, okay? Besides that, there's, there, there's also a central lattice position located in the very center of the unit cell, okay? So in the very, very center of the unit cell. So uh, now, how you can account for like how many total of lattice points we have inside, okay? Remember that I just said for the corner uh, lattice positions, one eighth of each one of them is contained inside of the unit cell. So each one of them we have one over eight that's contained inside the unit cell, and we have a total of eight of them. So we have one over eight times eight equals to one plus one. So this one comes from the fact that we have one lattice position fully contained inside the unit cell. In that case, one over eight times eight is equal to one, one inside the bracket plus one. It gives us that a uh, BCC unit cell uh, has a total of two lattice points fully contained inside the unit cell. Now let's see how to calculate the density from the lattice parameters, okay? So uh, the density calculation is shown here as the equation 2. 
where in the numerator we have the product between the number of let's points, which we just learned how to calculate for a BCC unit cell, multiplied by the molar mass of the compound, or in this case, as we work with metals, the molar mass of the, the metal, okay? Then this product is divided by the volume of the unit cell multiplied by the Avogadro's number, okay? So you might be asking where the let's see parameter is contained on this equation. The let's see parameter is specifically contained here in the volume, okay? In the case of a cubic unit cell, uh, not only BCC, but also the uh, simple cubic or uh, face-centered cubic, the volume is simply uh, the let's see parameter to the cube, okay? As all dimensions of the unit cell have the same let's see parameter. So that's here where the let's see parameter would be plugged, okay? In the volume, okay? Another thing to truly pay attention while calculating the density is about the units and unit conversion, okay? Densities are generally uh, reported in grams per cubic centimeter, okay? So, uh, the grams, they're going to enter on this equation through the molar mass of the compound or from the metal, okay? The molar mass, it's generally measured in grams per mole, okay? So that's where the grams will be put on this equation. That's where it's going to enter in the numerator, okay? The Avogadro's number is here. Uh, if you think about units consistency, it's here, in such a way it can cancel out uh, the mole that was inputted by plugging the molar mass, okay? So as a regardless number, it, its units is one over mole, so we have mole on the bottom and mole on the top, and then they would cancel each other, leaving the top of the fraction just in grams, okay? Then, extra attention should be paid when calculating the volume, when plugging the volume here, okay? Uh, it's for sure is going to require, require from the students uh, some sort of a unit conversion, okay? The reason why is, so basically, uh, the let's see parameters gen generally calculated in angstroms or nanometers, okay? So nanometers is around 10 to the minus 9 uh, meters, angstrom 10 to the minus 10 meters, whereas centimeters they are 10 to the minus second, okay? So a word of caution before plugging the value you have here uh, from my viewpoint would be take that lattice parameter that you learned how to calculate previously, convert that either from nanometer or angstrom, uh, each, you may have each of ones of the, the, those initial units, okay? So convert them first to centimeter, or first to meter and then to centimeter. And then once the let's parameter is in centimeter, then you calculate the volume. In the case of the cubic unit cell, it's simple. You raise to the, that value to the third power, and then you have that in cubic centimeters. And then it's uh, it's the right unit to be plugged there. In such a way, the final density result will be given in grams per cubic centimeter. One more thing to remember before I finish talking about density is that this equation too is a very general equation that allows us to calculate the density of any unit cell, not only BCC or even not only cubic unit cell. Uh, the point that needs to be adjusted in such a way it can be made general uh, to any type of unit cell are two points basically. Uh, the first one is the number of the let's points, which is very dependent from the type of the unit cell, okay? So how the let's positions are arranged in that unit cell. And the second one is the volume, okay? So the volume uh, calculation changes according to the crystalline system the unit cell belongs to, okay? So for instance, for tetragonal unit cell, where the, there, there are two let's parameters, so A and C. So in that case, the volume would be like A square, which would be the, the two let's parameters that are in a plane that are equal to each other, multiplied by the C, with the other let's parameter that is different, okay? So that is, those are the two points 
right should be uh, cautious modifying and uh, be careful looking for and research how to properly change data in case you would like to adapt this equation to to any other type of unit cell so the number of flat positions and the volume okay and obviously the molar mass of the compound which changes uh, regardless uh, the unit cell it's dependent from the identity of the compound or the metal that are using to calculate the density form. Now let's see how to calculate the atomic radius and the volume for a BCC unit cell. Okay, again here on the left we have uh, the body center cubic unit cell represented again. It's very important that uh, we understand like how to visualize a triangle inside this unit cell, like a right triangle, because that right triangle is going to allow us to use the Pythagorean theorem that you, we learned from geometry, and that's uh, how we're going to derive both the radius and the volume of a BC unit cell. So let's see uh, which one of those uh, sides of the triangle. The first side, which is more immediate to visualize, is this one, okay? Which is basically the length from top to bottom of the unit cell, which is basically the lattice parameter, okay? So that's the one of the dimensions of the unit cell, so this is one of the sides of the triangle, okay? Uh, then, the next uh, side will be this one that are showing in the bottom, okay? This one is simply like the diagonal of this bottom face, okay? Or from the, the diagonal of any face of the unit cell, but specifically from this bottom face, in this case, we are looking at. Uh, if you do the geometry and consider that this is also a triangle, okay? So the, uh, the two sides uh, that form the basis of the unit cell, plus its diagonal, so it forms a triangle. So we have A here, because it's the lattice parameter, A here, because it's the lattice parameter as well. If you use the uh, Pythagorean theorem, we're going to figure out that the diagonal is going to A times square root of two, okay? So we have figured out the two, uh, two out of the three sides of this triangle. This is A, and this is that the, the basis diagonal is a times square root of 2. Now we have to figure out the, the uh, largest uh, side of the triangle, okay? Uh, the hypotenuse of the triangle. So that's uh, a little harder to visualize and requires a little abstraction. So this unit itself is not like appropriate to see that, uh, that okay? But think about each one of those lattice positions you're showing here, they're kind of like space filling, okay? So what I mean by that, they are touching each other. So like we're doing here, okay? Uh, think about these three spheres. Are those three spheres, one, two, three? In such a way, they're touching each other. They are big enough that they can completely touch each other, okay? That's how it is derived. So you think about that, you're going to see a situation like this. So basically, one radius of this sphere, okay, which is represented here, touches the next sphere, the, the fully contained sphere, in the fully contained side of the unit cell sphere, in such a way that now we have like a, a segment that's described by one, ra one radius from this unit cell, then two radii sorry, one radius from this lattice position, then two radii of this lattice position, okay, so the diameter of this sphere, or this circle, and then one radius from this lattice position as well, okay? So if you do this, we see that this segment, that would be basically this side of the triangle, uh, that has a value of four times r. Okay, so those are the three sides of the right triangle we need to, visual, we need to visualize in order to uh, apply the Pythagorean theorem to calculate the radius of the unit cell. So we applied uh, the, two, uh, the Pythagorean theorem, okay? 
So uh, we take the two sides that are not the, the, the largest side of the triangle and raise that to the square. So a square plus a times square root of 2 to the square equals to the largest side to the square. So 4r to the square. Okay. If you solve this and isolate a, the lattice parameter a, you're going to see that the lattice parameter for a BCC unit cell is equal to 4 times r over the square root of 3. Okay. Then if you rearrange this in such we can isolate the radius, we have the radius is equal to a times square root of 3 over 4, okay? So that's how we calculate the atomic radius for a metal uh, having a body centered cubic unit cell, okay? So just keep in mind that this, all this development and this equation 3 that resulted from that, that's valid from only from BCC unit cell. Other type of cubic unit cells like primitive or face-centered cubic, they may have different uh, equation, okay? Uh, still dependent of the lattice parameter, but it, could be a com it would be a completely different equation because this development, it changes a lot, okay? Then, uh, the volume can be figured out as a function of the atomic radius. Remember that you told that for a cubic unit cell, the volume would be the lattice parameter to the cube, okay? So we saw this before we rearrange to get the equation 3, that the lattice parameters is equal to 4 times r over the square root of 3. So if you take this and cube that, then you're going to have the volume being equal to uh, 64 uh, times uh, radius, atomic radius to the cube over 3 times the square root of 3. Okay, so that will be the volume uh, as function of the atomic radius for a metal having a BCC unit cell. In this equation 5 that you see on the screen now, uh, it correlates the despacing of a certain planes with the Miller indices and uh, the lattice parameter of a cubic unit cell, okay? As you can see here, we have 1 over the D spacing uh, for a certain plane, have a certain indices, A to KL, is equal to the Miller indices A to the square, plus the Miller indices K to the square, plus the Miller indices L to the square. All this summation over the square of the lattice parameter. So this equation is general for any cubic structure, not only BCC, okay? Besides that, we should think about like uh, something called allowed reflections, okay? So basically, for uh, in X-ray diffraction, not all uh, planes, uh, not all combination of Miller indices are uh, allowed to generate like peaks uh, for certain planes in the X-ray diffractogram, okay? So basically what happens, unless the unit cell is a primitive unit cell, but like for uh, FCC and BCC, there are uh, selection rules, okay? There are reflections that are allowed and reflections that are not allowed. So in other words, I mean that for a BCC unit cell, uh, the peaks that show up there, they should be labeled in such a way that they have Miller indices, in such a way that H plus K plus L always would result in an even integer, okay? That's the allowed reflection rule for a BCC unit cell. So H plus Q plus L, they should be an uh, even integer, like we shown here on equation 6. Uh, as I told primitive, they are less restrictive, basically like they all reflections are allowed, and FCC is another uh, rule, okay? So that, but this is the case for BCC, H plus Q plus L should be an even integer. So. Next, we see a uh, few examples. So, what would be like the reflections with the lowest Miller indices, integer Miller indices that would like comply 
to this uh, allowed reflection rule. Consider that rule that you just saw that for a BCC unit cell, the H plus Q plus L should be equal to an even integer. So the lowest combination of Miller indices, I mean the combination of the Miller indices that would generate the lowest, um, the lowest even integer would be those ones that are shown here. So for instance, if like have Miller indices 0, 1, 1, in that case the 8KL uh, uh, summation would be equal to then 0, 0, 2, the 8KL summation would be also equal to. Then 1, 1, 2, so 8KL will be equal to 4, okay? So here we have the simulated uh, X powder X-ray diffractogram for the metal lithium, okay? So the simulation was done taking the a uh, CIF file from the crystallography open database, okay? Uh, and you see the, the, the card number here, the file number here, in case you want to reproduce that. Interestingly, so the peaks having uh, the lowest summation for the million indices are the ones that are going to show up uh, at lower angles in the diffractogram, okay? So this most intense peak is the 0, 1, 1, then the 0, 0, 2, and then the 1, 1, 2, okay? Another uh, thing to explain here is, okay, in the case of the cubic uh, crystalline system, the 0, 1, 1, and the 1, 1, 0 are 1, 0, 1 planes, they're going to produce the same result, okay? They're going to, like, they have the same multiplicity, that's what we say, okay? So in this case, we, I, I'm saying that to say that, in this case, we chose to represent, like, 0, 1, 1, instead of 1, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 2, instead of 2, 0, 0, because of like the, the the way we arrange the X, Y, and Z in the unit cell, okay? That is the only reason why. But for cubic, they're all going to like to, they would all like, uh, like the 0, 1, 1 and the 1, 1, 0, they would like, they should produce peak in the same two theta position, okay? So they have the same multiplicity, which is a concept that you're not going to see on this video. We just saw that the peaks having the uh, lowest even integer summation for the ADKL Miller indices, they tend to get uh, to be related with the peaks in the uh, the lower uh, two theta position. Okay. Now you might be asking why it works this way. Okay. So the explanation for that is based in the combination of these two equations, the equation five that you saw previously which relates the uh, spacing from ADKL, Miller indices, and the lattice parameters. And then the fundamental equation from the X-ray diffraction with the Bragg's law, okay? Just to remind us, for those of you that may not remember or may not be familiar with the Bragg's law, so N uh, is like an integer, okay? Multiply by lambda, so uh, uh, n is usually called like reflection order, okay? So generally we take this n equal one, but it's an integer, okay? Lambda is the wavelength of the incoming X-ray, two is the number, d is the d spacing, the same one that shows up in equation five, and then sine theta, where theta is the half of the angle, uh, the two, that angle that's going to show up the peak in the X-ray diffractogram. Remember that there is two theta, and then that angle should be converted to radians before we find the sine. Okay, so we rearrange this equation seven in such a way you write that as function of one over uh, d spacing, and make that uh, resulting equation equal to equation five, like I see here. What you get is this equation eight. Okay, so a squared plus k squared plus l squared over a squared is equal to 4 times sine squared of, uh, of theta 
over lambda square. Then, if you isolate the sine square of theta, we have that sine square of theta is equal to lambda uh, square over 4 times the square of lattice parameter. So this factor multiplied by the a square plus k square plus l square. This is equation 9, okay? So this equation 9, basically it correlates the angle theta, okay, with half of the angle where the peak shows up in the XRD pattern, with the uh, square of each Miller indices, and then, then sum it up, with the wavelength of the incoming X-ray, okay, uh, and then with the lattice parameter of the sample, okay? So, one thing uh, to think about that is uh, this lambda, generally depends on like the equipment, the X-ray source used on that equipment, which could be copper, uh, molybdenum, uh, different types of metals, okay? The most common one, the most common uh, X-ray source is the copper K-alpha, okay? Which has a wavelength equals 1.54 angstroms, okay? To confirm that statement that the Miller indices uh, summation producing the lowest even integer, there always will be relative to the peaks in the lower uh, to theta angles. Uh, we have an example here, how to apply this equation 9, okay? So, for doing this calculation, we fix that the lambda equals 1.54056 angstroms, which, as I told previously, is the wavelength produced by a copper key alpha X-ray source, and the lattice parameter equal to 3.5093 angstrom, with the lattice parameter for uh, lithium, according to uh, the crystallography open database file we used to simulate this pattern, okay? So we did this calculation, we took uh, ADKL equals to 0, 1, 1, then that's going to give a, a summation of the squares equal to equal to 2, okay? Then you have uh, a sine square by plugging those values uh, in the equation 9, that's going to give a sine square equals to 0 0.0964. If you find, apply the arc sine function and find the angle theta in radians having this sine square. So if you take the square of the sine and then apply the arc sine function to that result, we're going to find that we have a theta uh, angle in reds equal to 0 0.31. Convert that to degrees that correspond to an angle of 18.1 degrees. And if we multiply by 2, we have a 2 theta equal 36.2 degrees. So exactly around you observe the peak here. The same situation happens if you do the calculation from h equals 0, k equals 0, l equals 2, okay? So a square, k square plus l square equal 4. Uh, apply, plug in those values, equation 9 generates a sine square of theta equals 0 0.19. Take the square root of that value and figure out the arc sine for that. That's going to give a uh, theta angle equals to 0 0.454. Convert this angle to degrees, that's going to give a 26 degrees and multiply by 2, around 52. So that's where you observe the peaks equals 002. The same for uh, 8 key L equals 112. Okay, so if you do 8 square plus key square plus L square, that will be equal 6. Then if you uh, plug those values equation 9, that's going to find a sine square of theta equal to 0 0.289. Take the square root of that and apply the arc sine function, we find that corresponds to an angle equals to 0 0.56. Convert this angle from radians to degrees, that's going to be around 32.5. And if you multiply that by 2, that will be a 2 theta angle around 65, okay? So this like kind of confirms and explains us and gives us an example about how we correlate the Miller indices with the two theta position, how we can do that. Okay, after being able to uh, assign and correlate the Miller indices with the two theta 
peak position in the X, uh, X-ray uh, diffractogram. The next question students may have is, where are those planes located in a unit cell? Okay, so if you uh, put our ratio nail in the unit cell, okay, so think about a unit cell, we can locate and draw some dose of the planes, okay? So like the plane 011 would be located this way, okay, like diagonally, cutting like the, the C and B axis, okay? Then the plane 002 would be like the upper face of the unit cell. Uh, here, in general, people usually, when think about like a cubic unit cell, people tend to represent like the faces as like 001, 100, 010, uh, bar 100, 0, bar 10, and 00, 0 bar 1. Okay, that's how people represent the six faces. But remember here, we're restricting our example to BCC unit cell. So like reflections like 001 would not be allowed in the case of PCC unit cell. So that's the reason why the faces are represented by uh, indices uh, 2. So, so like this would be like a 002 plane, okay, from the unit cell, from BCC unit cell. And the plane 112 would be drawn like this one. Okay, so that's where the planes will be, those, specifically those three planes we gave the example, they will be represented and located inside a unit cell. Okay, after being able to know uh, how to correlate the peak to theta position with the minor indices and then being able to draw some of those uh, planes having a certain minor indices, within a unit cell. Another question that students may ask is that how are intensities determined in the XRD pattern, okay? So basically, uh, in, a, in a complete view, we can say that this equation 10 is an accurate uh, representation about how the density is determined, okay? So basically, it's a very complex uh, case how the densities will be determined because it depends of many factors, okay? As you can see, it depends like equipment constant that like compasses different types of configurations and parameters related with that certain equipment. Then you, there is an absorption coefficient. Then there's like the structure factor, which is probably the, the parameter from this equation that are going to, the only one that are going to explore further and the unit cell volume that we saw before. Then you have some other factors, the multiplicity, multiplicity which we talk very um, briefly about, pol polarization factor and Lor Lorentz factor, okay? So there are many things, as you can see, there are many things related to that and they're very complex, okay? So probably gonna not like it, comment about this. Some of these uh, parameters we talked a little bit in the videos about experiment three, when you talk about Ritfield refinement, okay? But most of them will not, okay? The only one that's going to further explore is the structure factor, so the, this uh, capital F ADKL. That's where like, as you can see, that's where the dependence with the Miller indices is contained. So basically what the structure factor is, the structure factor, it determines the amplitude and the phase of the uh, X-ray diffracted beams. It can be calculated according to this equation 11 here, okay? So basically, as you can see, this equation is a summation, okay? Uh, so what has been summed up? So what has been summed up are the atoms uh, on different equivalent positions, okay? There are atoms that they have like, although they may look different within the unit cell, actually, uh, if you apply some sort of symmetry operation, they have the same coordinates, okay? For instance, the eight corner atoms in, the, in, a, in a BCC unit cell they have the same equivalent position. They're equivalent, let's say, positions, okay? So, like, in the BCC, you would have, like, two atoms that we're going to count, okay? 
we're gonna count one corner atom, which will be representative for the all eight, and one uh, central, the, the central atom located, the central lattice position, okay? So like for BCC, that summation would go from J equal one until J equal two. And you have two things contained in this summation, scattering factor, so like this small f, and then you have an exponential part, where the exponent of this exponential function is uh, minus two times pi complex number i, then you have age multiplied by the coordinate x, k multiplied by the coordinate y, and l multiplied by the coordinate z of each atom. Okay, so we do this product about the, uh, the scattering factor times that exponential part. So the scattering factor from that particular atom multiplied by basically a dependence on the position of that atom. So that's how we calculate and do the summation from all atoms that you have different equivalent x, y, z position. And then from that, we're gonna to obtain the structure factor, okay? So now, next, you're gonna see uh, some details about the scattering factor. About the scattering factor, a few things that you can say about that. The scattering factor is very dependent of the atomic number of the atom, okay? Like you can see here in this graph, they're trying to represent it, uh, the scattering factor as function of the angle, okay? For three different atoms, tungsten, with the heaviest one, like um, atomic number 74, then iron, atomic number 26, and aluminum, atomic number 13. So y-axis is measuring the scattering factor, and then x-axis is the sine of theta times the lambda, the wavelength of the incident x-ray beam, okay? So as you can see here, for a same angle or a same product, sine angle times uh, lambda, uh, the, as the element is heavier, uh, higher will be its scattering factor. So if you uh, trace a vertical line here, so you see for this specific combination angle times lambda, the, uh, the tungsten will be, would have much higher scattering factor than iron and aluminum, okay? Also, as you can see, the scattering factor for a same element is very dependent on the two theta angle. So as the two theta angle progresses, uh, the scattering factor for a particular element decreases, okay? That happens, the reason why it happens is because the unit cell has a, a, a uh, it's not an infinite, okay? It has a finite size, okay? So uh, basically, those like amplitude and coherence relationships, they start to be like as intense as they would be as the uh, angle uh, increases, okay? So those are the few things we can say about the scattering factor that um, for our introductory discussion that we're having here, they might be important to keep in mind, okay? So just to re recap, you are finishing up this video, okay? So we learned a lot of uh, new concepts on that, mostly related uh, by taking the BCC unit cell as our example. So we learned how to determine the density, volume, and atomic radius for a BCC unit cell. Then we saw how uh, Miller indices, they correlate with the lattice parameters uh, and the spacing and how we can correlate like the uh, Miller indices that are allowed to for the peaks to have in the case of a BCC unit cell, okay? Uh, next, we saw how we can represent, and then you confirm with an examples how uh, those peaks, they would have that certain set of Miller indices. Then you saw examples uh, about how to draw the planes with a, a BCC unit cell. Uh, then you talk a little bit about the intensity. We saw the intensity is dependent on many factors. The one that's most important is the structure factor and how the structure factor relates with the scattering factor and how the scattering factor, we saw some trends regarding atomic number and two theta angle, okay? So that's all we have as an introduction here, okay? 
For instructors, there's a lot of things you can add here. You can add information about the primitive, FCC, unit cell, you can give more, more examples, you can give examples about other uh, simple crystalline systems like the tetragonal, maybe uh, orthorhombic as well, it might be useful. Uh, for the students, I think, uh, uh, I hope it was uh, a good introduction, okay, to the topic. Uh, and uh, I'm I would be glad if uh, if you say you learned something new from that. And don't forget that this video is part of a series of video uh, in our channel that uh, are all related with a paper. Okay, that paper we describe three experiments related with X-ray diffraction that can either be done remotely or can be done in a face-to-face -face fashion, so using like mostly uh, uh, free softwares, okay, and simulation softwares. Uh, basically, uh, if you are institution that don't have, doesn't have a powder X-ray diffraction equipment, you can still do most of those equipment, uh, uh, most of those experiments, okay, because they work mostly with simulated data. And I think they are a good starting point to introduce students to uh, those uh, concepts related to the X-ray diffraction. Make them, have them, they put their hands on data and treat them, okay? So I encourage you to take a look in all the videos on this playlist to learn about, and also uh, check uh, in the comment box below how you can access the paper that you published about this, these experiments. Thank you so much. Thank you for thank you so much for uh, and obviously I would be glad if those videos and the paper could be useful to any instructor or student. It would be great to know that. Thank you for watching the video. I uh, appreciate your presence and your comment, your like or anything. And thank you so much. Bye bye.